Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Marina Iskro, and I'm Associate Curator of Media and Performance Art at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. Thank you so much for joining me and Teresita Fernandez in conversation as part of the museum's weekly artist talk series, Talking to Our Time. Cart captioning and American Sign Language interpretation are provided for tonight's program. And you can find more information about both of those options in the chat. Tonight we'll be speaking for about 40 minutes and then opening it up to audience Q&A. So if you'd like to submit a question, feel free to do so at any time using the Q&A button on Zoom. Okay, and now I am truly honored to introduce Teresita Fernandez. Born in Miami and based in New York, Teresita is a conceptual artist best known for her immersive sculptures and monumental public artworks that often incorporate motifs and materials from the natural world. Her work invites us to rethink the ways we talk about landscape and place, and in the process to develop more nuanced understandings of identity, belonging, and power. Over the course of her career, Teresita has received numerous awards and recognitions. She is a MacArthur Foundation Fellow. She has received a Guggenheim Fellowship. And in 2011, she was appointed by President Barack Obama to serve on the US Commission of Fine Arts where she was the first Latina member. Her work is in museum collections all over the world and can currently be seen at SF MoMA, the High Museum in Atlanta, the Perez Art Museum in Miami, and the New Orleans Museum of Art. Next month, a major installation of Teresita's work, Fire, United States of the Americas, will open at the Philadelphia Museum of Art as a centerpiece of the museum's renovated galleries. She also has a solo exhibition at Georgetown University's De La Cruz Art Gallery opening in September, which is very exciting for those of us in DC. So with that, I'd like to welcome Teresita. Um, please turn on your camera and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hi, Marina. Hi. <laughs> So um, let's get started. I wanted to start off by asking you very broadly um, about the idea of landscape, which is really central to your practice. Um, so maybe you could tell us in general terms about kind of how you understand the meaning of landscape and um, how you approach it in your work. Sure. Um, well, first, I'm happy to be here with you tonight. Um, thank you for inviting me to, to speak with you. Um, and yeah, you know, I mean, my work often gets described as being about landscape and it's a kind of um, foil that if, for, for lack of a better word, that I've, that I've used for a long time. Um, and it's interesting to think about our perception of even the word landscape, because most of what we think of as landscape comes from ideas of landscape paintings or these ideas of like framed vistas. And these are sort of non-threatening ideas of, of the land and, you know, kind of picturesque. Um, and um, what I'm trying to do is really to layer meaning onto the concept of landscape so that it's not just being seen as a physical geographic site, but also as a landscape that's historic and social and political, and I'd also add uh, emotional and mutable and volatile. Um, so thinking of the landscape in this way, less like say a painting, a Frederick Church painting of the Hudson Valley and um, more like a mass grave on the US Texas border or decimated swath of Amazonian rainforest, all which have much deeper implications in terms of human life uh, connected to ideas of place. Um, so land is also always about the history of oppression and power, you know, inadvertently. Um, and I always like to say that landscape is more about what you don't see than what you do see. Um, and that's been an interesting enough uh, proposition and, and question for me that, that, that I've been able to um, be entertained by, by thinking about that for, for many decades, um, making work about these omissions and erasures within the landscape, um, really using the concept of landscape as a vehicle, as a lens to, to look at ourselves. Um, so I'm unearthing place as a way of understanding who we are and, and as an extension of where we are. Um, and by default, uh, you know, who we are in relation to one another. Um, and um, in this 
in, in this sort of way of thinking that that's a kind of very radical understanding of landscape, it's easy to, um, to then imagine that we're actually always in many places at once. And in my own work, I refer to this as stacked landscape, just like my own little term for it, um, where when you start to peel back the layers of where you are uh, and what happened before and what you're not seeing, um, you're, you're really in so many places at once um, simultaneously. That's great. I love that term stacked landscape. That's one of the first things I came across in your work and find so rich and productive. So I hope we can talk more about that later. Um, so today um, we're going to be looking really closely at a new body of work that you recently exhibited um, in a show called Maelstrom at Lehman Maupin. So we have a short video here um, of a work that was in that show called Caribbean Cosmos. So why don't we um, take a moment to watch it and then we can talk about it. Okay, so we've spoken about your interest in landscape, um, but recently you've been making work like this piece that revolves sort of more specifically around um, evocations of natural disaster, or we use the term eco-trauma in the title of this talk. So tell me what drew you to this topic of natural disaster. Um, so a big part of my project is asking how we can teach ourselves to decolonize the way that we think about geography and a kind of hierarchy of place. Um, and of course, language is one of the most colonized spaces. So I'd start by looking more closely at your question. Um, when we say natural disaster, we often think of it as something out of our control, you know, or like, you know, the hand of God or fate. Um, and a lot of it really comes from a Judeo Christian understanding, a cosmology of the world where like good things happen and bad things happen. Um, and the word natural in natural disaster implies that it's supposed to happen. Um, and, you know, we know of course that catastrophes in weather and in the environment and in our ecosystem are usually thoroughly man-made. Um, when we look at places that are super susceptible um, to quote unquote natural disasters like New Orleans or Haiti or Flint, Michigan or Puerto Rico, um, we need to understand that it's not that nature chooses these places, um, but rather that the instability and the centuries of extraction and the overall lack of infrastructure and lack of basic human rights makes these places, especially and the people in them, obviously, especially vulnerable to what we later think of as a natural disaster. Um, and I think it's also interesting that the title of this talk includes the word, uh, the term ecotrauma, which is, it's not a word that I myself use, it's, it's your title, um, but it's, it's very fitting here. And I, I kind of had to think a lot about it. Um, and if we break down eco, um, you know, the word ecotrauma, eco comes from the Greek word oikos, which means home or dwelling place. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as humans, we are a small component of a complex ecosystem, not, you know, we're, we think of ourselves rather as a small component of an ecosystem, like of an ecosystem, rather than in an ecosystem, right? So these, this, these, this kind of shifting idea of like, are you in it or are you of it are things that I think about a lot. Um, and I think that we need to shift our framing to think differently so that we come aware that as humans, we are one small and utterly dispensable part of an immense and very intelligently organized dwelling place and system. Um, and the word trauma, which succinctly is defined as meaning something bad happening too much and too fast. So it's something that can't be handled or processed in a healthy way. And you can apply this idea of trauma to everything, to individ individual trauma or collective trauma or environmental trauma. Um, and um, the, the idea of trauma is not the event itself. Trauma is not the event, the bad event itself, say, you know, mining or racism or wildfires or 
or floods, but rather the aftermath of the event in its very oppressive and fractured existence that has no way to get resolved. You know, it's like it's yeah. stuck. It's the inability to overcome something violent. Um, uh, so when we think of what we often think of as a catastrophic event is deeply linked to these repetitive cycles of trauma uh, and corruption and violence that, that stem from, from capitalism and from disaster capitalism and all of those uh, uh, ways of understanding the world that we're so familiar with. Absolutely. That's a great answer and a much better interpretation of eco-trauma than I had even had in mind. I think I was just thinking about kind of the intertwining of of human subjectivities in addition to, you know, these sort of disembodied natural disasters. And, you know, the fact that actually those two things are, are very much dependent on each other, that we inflict damage on the earth and the earth in turn, you know, inflicts damage on us and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so next I wanted to ask you kind of about your choice to focus this last body of work specifically on the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you could tell us more about that. Sure. Um... Yeah, so the, the title of the exhibition um, that I did um, was Maelstrom, called Maelstrom. And in many ways, I think of the Caribbean, I've been thinking of, of doing work about the Caribbean specifically for a long time. And I had always kind of like put it off in part because it was, it felt autobiographical, but it also felt like this very kind of exposed, uh, 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 very specific way of, of looking at, at a place. Um, and in many ways, I think of the Caribbean as the center of the world. Um, and you know, within our kind of American exceptionalism and continental thinking, um, you know, what do all these little islands mean? You know, especially from that very uh, United States point of view. And um, it's no accident that there's so many derogatory, you know, terms associated with all of these tiny little islands, like you know. The, 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 the comment that Trump made, the shithole country or the, the third world or periphery or global south, um, these are invented terms with the primary goal uh, of them to shape our perception of a region as inferior. Um, you know, you have no, you know, you, you don't have a north if you don't create a south. Uh, you don't have a continental place if you don't have the periphery, right? So these things go in tandem and they actually start to define one another. Um, and they also, in this, in these terms, these, these ways of perceiving certain places so that some places are, you know, better than others. Um, they also leave out the epic importance of the Caribbean as a geographic region that's uh, so sort of like, it's so, central to, to everything that we think of uh, in terms of the global, so economically, intellectually, and in every other way, um, as well as to many ideas that we have about what's modern, um, which you know is also problematic in other ways. Um, so in Maelstrom, I refer to the enduring violence and devastation that was ignited by colonization. And the Caribbean is the first point of colonial contact in the Americas. Um, so the show sought to look beyond sort of like the dominant continental narratives that we've been taught uh, and certainly in, in the United States, our education has, you know, sort of omitted the, the, the beginning of the Americas. Like it all starts with the United States and, and the British colonies. Um, and um, I'm remembering too, like, you know, as, a, as an art student, I remember the first time that I went to to Europe um, and saw all these very sort of grand Baroque um, structures and, and, and cathedrals and all of this gold. And, you know, the, the, it felt so far away, it felt so grand and it felt so different from the way that we think of um, Latin America in general and the Caribbean. Um, and it, it, you know, I remember like the, the emotional sort of, uh, uh, you know, thing that, that, that that clicked in me, understanding that the the grandeur of you know European Baroque um, everything, things we were studying in art books, was really you know about stolen land and the enslavement and genocide of indigenous and African peoples, but also that the actual natural resources that were used to build the grandeur of European Baroque, um, you know, don't come from the Baroque. In terms like you know the the world's wealth really comes from. Um, from what was extracted in the Caribbean through uh, enslaved peoples and the natural resources themselves. Um, 
So there's really, if you, if you think about it, there's really no concept of America without the Caribbean. Um, the Caribbean is, uh, you know, factually, literally um, the locus of that. Uh, so I was trying to reframe the importance of the region, not just in terms of how it changed the world, but also trying to shed light on ideas that we've come to believe about modernity and citizenship and nation. Um, they really come out of the, the, the precedents of the, the Haitian revolution and the age of revolutions. Um, after Haiti liberated itself, it then taught dozens of Latin American countries uh, that were under European rule to do the same and to gain independence. And so we, we like to think of the American Revolution as being the pivot, but it's really the Haitian Revolution. And this tiny little island, you know, that radically changes um, the world and the rest of the Americas. And this is, this is interesting to think about in terms of scale, because we often think that the bigger thing is the more powerful thing, um, which makes it very easy to dis disregard or to completely omit the, the small things, which are actually sometimes very, very important. Um, uh, so yeah, the, that's what the show was about, to really look at the Caribbean as central and epic and defining of notions of a global context, instead of just looking at it through the lens of the poverty that's created by colonization, um, which is of course how it's stereotypically represented. Right, absolutely. So um, anyone who has encountered your work before knows how much it's grounded in research. Mm -hmm. um, it's always been part of your practice. But in the case of this show, I found it interesting that you um, published a virtual, or sorry, a visual essay, um, kind of giving people a direct window into the sources that you were reading. Um, so I wonder if you could talk about that essay and kind of your decision to make it public this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I usually don't make an essay at all. It usually just all lives in my mind and in, you know, dozens of, you know, folders inside of folders inside of folders on my on my desktop um, but um, the visual essay and it was hard for me to make the decision to to publish the visual essay but there were a few there were a few factors that that convinced me that it was the right thing to do one was that I've I've always relied very heavily on not telling people what the work is about or and especially not telling them what it's about when they're experiencing it because I, I'm I'm very much the, the work is very much rooted in like the phenomenological understanding of something and the viewer as someone who completes the circuit of meaning in the work in their very own subjective way um, and and in the tactile qualities of it and in the sort of uh, the dimensionality of it and the shifting properties of it. So I was I was concerned that this body of work that I had been working on for you know almost two years at that point um, when I had to show um, would would not have the benefit of that experiential quality that I so mm -hmm. depended on uh, in the past. And um, the other reason, so there are a couple of things, right? So I, I, um, I, I have been for quite some time now, very, I have made a project, very adamantly made a project of keeping really impeccable archives of my work. Um, not just of how it's made, but of my research and also my writing and also um, the context that I'm trying to create around the work. And so the work is not just the object, the physical artwork, the art object, you know, the, the, the artifact of, of, of the thing, um, but it's also the context that I create around it. And sometimes that context is is very fragile and it's very specific and it's off, off almost always very very complex it's it's you know based on a lot of research which doesn't necessarily have to be visible to the viewer to understand the work um you know preferably not but it is a, a sort of very intimate aspect of my creative um you know thinking my 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 way of getting there if you will um and i um i with this body of work, I, I was especially um, careful, I think, about not wanting these images of the Caribbean to be just another stereotype. Um, and if you think of like, you know, the cliches of the Caribbean are, you know, either one, one thing or another, it's either, you know, poverty um, and, you know, disarray and, you know, a mess or, or you know disaster 
or it's, you know, island paradise, uh, resorts. Um, you know, I always like to think of it as sort of like the front of something and the back of something. Um, and in fact, all of those things leave out all of the nuances and all of the depth. Um, so by publishing the visual essay, I, I wanted to really give a much more well-rounded and deeper look at all of the components that went into the thinking of each each of these works um, in order to sort of dignify the, the subject matter that I was working with and the images, some of them which were um, very sort of um, emotional images and emotional subject matter that I wanted to, 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 to honor in a dignified way by sharing the context of what I meant when I say this uh, or when I do these works. And I think that that, that idea of intention is very, very important to me. Um, it's, um, it's important that regardless of whether the viewer or not sees every aspect of it, um, that I know that it's there because I put it in there. Um, and especially the social political content, which sometimes is not so visible if someone's not looking or doesn't know that my work has that. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, and we put a link to that essay in the chat. If anyone wants to check it out, I would highly recommend it. Um, so I think we should move on to another major work from the show. This is a sculpture called um, Rising Lynched Land. So why don't we go ahead and play that video? So it's interesting um, actually to hear you talk about scale earlier in a kind of geopolitical sense, thinking about sort of the scale of the Caribbean in comparison with the United States. Um, but I wanna ask you here about scale in kind of more of a literal sense. Mm -hmm. um, so you play a lot with kind of juxtaposing micro and macro scales and moving between the two. Um, so maybe you could talk about um, kind of the monumentality of the sculpture we just saw and the role of, of scale in your work more generally. Yeah, sure. So the the sculpture that you that you just uh, showed the video of it's 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 called Rising Lynched Land, um, and the the piece itself the intention was that it in, for it to embody the the gravitas of, of violence while also um, while also kind of uh, suggesting a metaphorical rising, you know. So the, it had like a very redemptive quality of just like the the violence, but also like this this sort of like redemption. Um, and it's made of scorched wood and copper. Um, so in making it, what I'm doing is I'm turning these natural materials of vegetation and mineral into a suspended body that appears to ascend. Um, and um, I often do this where I anthropomorphize the landscape and I think of the landscape as, as, as another being or like another human. Um, and so that, you know, you look at it, but it also looks back at you, you know, there's a sort of like consciousness. Um, in terms of scale, um, I'm interested in the connection between the immense and the intimate. Um, so the tiny and the vast and how they are connected, how they're actually different scaled versions of one another, um, like an acorn and a forest. Um, and um, I actually think of my work as being completely figurative, although people rarely see this and my, my work rarely gets uh, described that way. I, I do think of it as very figurative. Um, I think of the viewer as being the figure in the work. And this plays also a lot into, into the scale. Um, my work is often like very big, but it's all, also made of very tiny little sections that you know correlate to like the size of your, of your eye socket or, um, you know, your, your own reflection uh, uh, on the surface of, of the work. Um, and, you know, this goes back to um, what I was saying before, this idea that, you know, you're, it's not that you're in the landscape or like this character occupying the stage of the landscape, but that we're of it, that, 
you know, that we're like it and that we're part of its uh, systems, um, we're, we're made in the same way. Um, in Rising Lynch land, land, there's no body present, you know, it's not like a figure is being depicted, um, but this uprooted palm is, um, is suspended in this very somber pose. And in the gallery, which you, you know, you, you, couldn't really see from, you couldn't really perceive from, from images from some of the photographs, but in the gallery, it actually moved very slightly. Um, it was a very kind of sad piece for me to make and, and a very emotional piece for me to, to, to make. Um, um, so, so yeah, the, the idea of scale has a whole lot to do with um, our own bodies and how our own bodies and the way that our bodies are made are um, essentially just like everything else in the universe, right? So this idea that our bodies are synchronized to the, the churning of the universe because we're made of the same stuff like iron and, and carbon, um, quite literally. Um, and so the, 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 the very tiny things, you know, that are microscopic, like, you know, um, the way that our, uh, you know, nerve endings or synapses look and the way a galaxy looks is, is exactly the same, right? It's like these, these two versions, these two scales of, of something that's essentially made of the same thing. Great, yeah. Well, I think um, maybe we should transition to the next group of works called Urakan, um, because you were speaking a lot about kind of the body and the landscape in talking about rising lynched land. Um, and this group of works also addresses that topic um, fairly directly. So why don't we play this video? Okay, so Teresita, could you walk us through um, what we just saw and some of the sort of stories or histories uh, behind this particular work? Sure. Um, so the body of work, uh, the, the whole installation really um, is called Huracan and it's, uh, it, it's made up of a, a bunch of smaller pieces, 30 of these small little collages, the drawing on the walls, and then the piece that you see on the wall that looks like a, like a ring. Um, so the, the entire installation refers to um, the systemic exploitation of women and their bodies, uh, particular to, particularly in the Caribbean region, right? You can sort of look at that concept anywhere. Um, and Huracan is a Taino word, uh, meaning God of the Storm. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's only in this part of the world that those kinds of storms are called huracan or are called hurricane. Um, and the Spanish colonizers basically took the, the Taino word and turned it into huracan or hurricane. Um, so in 1953, and this is what led me sort of like my research is very much sort of like going down the rabbit hole. And I just, I, I read and research all the time. So I just like accumulate information that I think is relevant or important. And I sometimes don't know how it all connects, right? So this is part of like the, the kind of alchemy of putting something together. But um, I was interested in how in 1953, um, the United States began um, using uh, female names, women's names to identify uh, uh, storms, um, not just storms, but really sort of devastating storms. Uh, and um, so each of those little collages that you see is named after a historic hurricane, Maria, Paloma, Nana, Katrina. Um, and then the piece that you see on the wall is called Archipelago Cervix. And it is actually made up of all of the islands of the Caribbean, every single one um, connected into this kind of daisy chain. And, um, and of course the sort of dual reference to both the archipelago as a, a solid, piece of one thing, you know, that's all connected and the, and, and the word cervix, which of course is, you know, like this porthole, uh, this, this window, this cave, this womb, um, this, this opening to, to this very sort of feminized uh, space in, within the installation. 
And um, I, I, I was making a pointed reference to both the use of the women's names for catastrophic weather events and the, his, the history of violence against Puerto Rican women specifically, um, who were unknowingly used uh, to test and to develop the birth control pill um, under the support of Margaret Sanger. Um, and interestingly enough, right, uh, because Margaret, Margaret Sanger is like, you know, a heroine for uh, uh, American women in the United States and really seen as like, the person, you know, Planned Parenthood and the person who, you know, helped women take control of their reproductive uh, 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 rights and, um, you know, women were able to join the, the, the workforce, et cetera, et cetera, all of these things that we think of here. Um, most Americans are unaware that between 1930 and 1970, uh, one third of Puerto Rican women um, were sterilized. That's 35% uh, legally sterilized. Um, and not just there, but in the United States as well. Um, many immigrants as well were unknowingly uh, sterilized up through the 1970s, uh, women of color, black women, indigenous women. Um, and, uh, you know, this is something that in our own families, I mean, I, there are many stories in my own family of, 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 uh, of women um, immigrants and my family from the Caribbean who who had stories and who it was very common, right? It was a very common thing that you would that you would hear about. Um, it was called la, la operación, um, and they didn't know, right? Many of them didn't speak English. Uh, some of these things, you know, they happened in the United States as well, um, of course, and they continue to happen. So one of the things I wanted to point out, you know, through this work about the Caribbean is that it isn't just this historical thing that we look at, it's also that these things continue to happen. So um, even you know, to this day in ICE facilities across the United States, uh, women are being sterilized. And so this is a, a very American practice, if anything, and it has, um, it's, it's something that has a long history in, in this country. Um, since the 1950s, um, Puerto Rico, um, and I'll stop here because, it's very, very important to understand that Puerto Rico is the oldest existing colony in the world. And I will repeat that. I will repeat that because people, you know, they, they think about colonization um, as something that happened a long time ago. Puerto Ricans are colonial subjects right now. Um, Puerto Rico is the oldest existing colony in the world. Um, this, this is, you know, I, 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 um, it never ceases to, to shock me how many people I know who are even involved in social justice who have no problem vacationing in Puerto Rico and, uh, you know, sort of going into that resort mentality um, without really understanding that it is a colony right now. Um, and, you know, the word territory as well is a very deceiving word um, because it's just, a, it's just a, a fancy word that replaces colony, but it's the same thing. Um, so since the 1950s, Puerto Rico has been used as an island laboratory basically by the US um, from, you know, everything from to, you know, experiments on controlling uh, the, the growth of, you know, quote unquote, uh, unwanted populations to fast tracking FDA approval on experimental drugs, uh, tests and procedures, including sterilization um, performed on victims who were often unaware, um, uninformed, and really completely powerless to some of the things that were being done to them. Um, this continues to happen in many ways there. Um, for example, there is uh, you know, an extreme, extreme uh, cancer rate on the island of Vieques in Puerto Rico, off of Puerto Rico, um, which was uh, used by the US Navy as a bombing range and testing ground until 2003. And it is still a very, very toxic place. You know, people are very sick there. So um, that installation was about kind of fusing together all of these, uh, um, all of these different modes really of, of, uh, of colonial violence that this tiny island and especially, you know, the women there in the context of this installation and, and this very sort of, it's very, it's an it's a installation that really is about a feminine space, you know, that, that archipelago kind of uh, cervix on the wall is like, you know, you're, you're entering through it and, um, the little collages are almost like, they're very abstract. They're actually, they look like little maps, but they're not. They're just very abstract shapes that are almost like these little embryos. Um, uh, and the, the entire installation had this 
you know, horizon line that was drawn all the way around over and over and over again, almost like this water line, you know, this kind of rising and this falling. Um, and these are the things that I was thinking about as I was uh, putting together this body of work. Amazing, thank you. Um, and again, I'll just plug your essay one more time because there are some really great essays on some of the histories that Teresita was talking about linked there. Um, so I wanna shift now um, to talking about your work on more of a material level um, because kind of the, the use of materials with very particular histories and associations has really been a hallmark of your practice. Mm -hmm. So I thought we could watch um, a really great example of this, which is a video of your work Black Beach Unpolished Diamond. And let's play that. Okay, so tell us a little bit about the materials that you used um, to create this work. And then maybe you can talk um, kind of about how you approach your, your choice of materials more broadly. Sure. Um, well, I think of materials as being, you know, parts of places, um, literally like extracted. Um, and uh, as a sculptor, I, you know, I, I, I I, at some point, you know, I really kind of started to understand any material that I used as being sort of um, a version of, of the landscape. Um, the, these pieces, the Black Beach um, uh, pieces are made with charcoal. Uh, charcoal is basically burned trees. Um, there are other things in there as well. There's some uh, wood that comes from whiskey barrels. Um, there are, uh, there's some lava, uh, there's a bunch of different things, right? But in this body of work or in, at the end of body of work, so it's almost like I'm making, and we'll see this as we speak about the Vinales works later, but it's almost like I'm taking a material that is a landscape, that is an actual place, and I'm using it to create another landscape, a kind of imagined landscape. So by doing this, I'm kind of fusing two histories at once. And it's, it's really very much like making a collage, right? But three-dimensionally and conceptually more importantly, right? So it's, it's, it's less that I'm fusing the physicality and more than I'm that I'm fusing the, the, the concept of one place or another. Um, and the, you know, the, the, the idea of more than one place. And by doing that, I'm kind of um, um, layering what they mean and how they inform one another. Um, so the, the Black Beach and Polished Diamonds, um, the, the title of the, of the series comes from uh, two essays by Glissant. One is called The Burn Beach, one's called The Black Beach. And uh, in these essays, uh, Glissant, who's a, you know, Caribbean intellectual and very, very important thinker who kind of, you know, um, teaches the importance of a kind of archipelagic thinking as opposed to a continental thinking, right? So uh, an archipelagic thinking is, the, it's all about relation. And the book that these essays are in is called Poetics of Relation. Um, not all of his works are translated into English, but that, that book is, it's a very important um, work. Um, and he has a very particular way of, of talking about things because it's very it's very poetic. It's very sort of it's very sort of slippery. It's it's not academic. Um, and um, one of the one of the uh, uh, essays, one of the beach essays, in one of the beach essays, he he talks about a man, uh, a, a wandering man, a man that's like moving on this beach, and he's just like aimlessly walking up and down this beach, and you know everything's sort of shifting around him, churning, changing. You know the ebb and flow, the water's edge. You know the the Caribbean as this sort of like the island the idea of islandness as edge, as this constantly shifting edge that's that's you know creating itself and then coming apart and then recreating itself, and and this man's sort of like wayfinding, really like looking for himself within this chaos um, as this constant sort of way of 
orienting himself and reorienting himself. And it's a, it's a very beautiful metaphor for this archipelagic way of thinking where, um, you know, everything's always sort of changing and, and nothing is fixed. So when we think of like, even like, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the continental sort of understanding of land and the United States, you know, we think of it as this very solid thing. It's this very kind of fixed thing. Um, and so there's some very uh, poetic uh, references that Lisant uses that were very influential for me in, in general, but it is specifically in this body of work. Great, wonderful. Well, you mentioned the Vinyalas works and I wanted to bring those in because they, um, although they're earlier, they speak to some of the themes we've been discussing. So I think we have a still image here. Yes. Um, so we're seeing some, some sculptures and panels that you made, I believe in 2015, um, making reference to Vinales Cuba. So maybe you could just tell us about kind of your interest in that place and how you chose to depict it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so yeah, the, the sculpture that you see in the foreground here is called Vinales Reclining Nude. So again, so you, again you have this reference to a human body, in this case, a woman's body, you know, sort of draped over, you know, these these uh, very modernist looking uh, Brancusias kinds of, uh, of uh, plinths and bases, right? So, but they don't, they kind of don't add up. Um, they're, they're very uh, not lined up and they're sort of off kilter. And um, the Vinales Valley in Cuba is very much like that. It, 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 it's often sort of, it's sort of like the, the Cuban imaginary, you know, thought of as this like, you know, rolling hills and like uh, the, you know, a reclining woman. Um, it's very, it's very lush. It's a very surreal landscape. It's very sort of otherworldly and very green. Um, and so, um, and then the panels around are basically they're they're glazed ceramic. And again, here I'll introduce that idea of materiality again, right? So glazed. Ceramic is, um, they're basically like mosaics, right? So ceramics, clay ceramics is basically clay. It's the earth. It's fired at a very high temperature. Glazes that are creating these colors are basically just minerals also from the earth, extracted from the earth, used to create this other landscape. Um, and what you see on top, the images that you see on the wall, as well as the, the, the sort of green pieces that you see on top of the sculpture, are I'll take well the, on the sculpture they're actually physical pieces of malachite that um, that are from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and when I first um, when I first saw these pieces of malachite, um, they reminded me so much of the Vinale, of the actual Vinales Valley in in Cuba, and so again I'm playing around here with this idea that. I'm creating this imagined landscape of Vinales, right? Because Vinales doesn't really look like this. It's completely abstracted. But I'm making it with material that is from lots of different places, including the Democratic Republic of Congo. And so what I'm doing by doing that is like layering these, these histories. Um, in, the, in the Vinales Valley, there's a, a very extensive cave system. Um, which I also visited, and many of the images that I used came from uh, some of the, the photography that I did there. Um, and these caves are important because they were um, they were they were homes for indigenous people, uh, for Taínos, um, and they were also the place where um, uh, enslaved uh, Africans from run up from surrounding plantations um, would hide basically and and create like little communes form little communes where they could hide during the day inside of these caves and so by using this rock which is from africa it's from congo and using it to describe the landscape of vinales cuba i was i was fusing these ideas of of place and of being in many places at once yeah fantastic well, it's already 7.45, um, so I'd love to end our conversation by speaking a bit about your public art practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is actually a great segue because you recently made um, a version or another addition to the Vinales body of work um, in New Orleans in a much larger public form. So um, we have a little video showing some footage of that work along with, I think, two other major installations that you've made in New York and in Cambridge. So why don't we play that video now?
battled her way. The world did not want another brown, another slant-eyed olive Indian black child. Did not want another rainbow-empowered song added to repertoire in blue or azure or indigo or Caribbean crystal. Did not want another mouth to feed. Um, so as you know, I'm a curator actually of media and performance art. So I'd love to hear you speak um, about the installations that we saw and especially in terms of the role of like performance and movement and viewer activation in your work. Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I, I really think of viewers as both kind of spectators and performers at once. Um, and uh, and so you saw like, you know, you sort of saw like a greatest hits there, <laughs> a bunch of different things that all are very complex pieces in and of themselves. But since, you know, we don't have that much time, um, I'll sort of very quickly recap what they all have in common, which is that, you know, for, 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 for a good amount of time now, what I've been doing, and this goes back to the archival question and the visual essay, is I've really been trying to um, very actively have agency over the programming that happens around the piece. And um, it started to really bother me that you know the piece was sort of put out there and then just kind of fetishized that this, as this art object and then other people would program what would happen on it oftentimes missing the entire point of the artwork itself from a, from a conceptual point of view. Um, and so I started to develop programming. Um, you saw a lot of things there. You saw uh, Fata Morgana, which I did in Madison Square Park. Um, Fata Morgana had, was up for almost a year and there were, you're seeing a very small portion of the programming that happened there. Um, the, 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 the loud music um, and the, 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 the line of people walking underneath um, was a way of really kind of um, doubling the reflection of everything that happened in the space and asking myself, you know, who actually occupies public space? Who does public space belong to? Um, what you saw there was um, a, a collaboration that I did with uh, Yesenia Selier, who's a, 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 a Afro-Cuban, um, a scholar on Afro-Cuban art and, uh, and history. And um, she recreated Dia de Reyes, which is in colonial times in Cuba was the only day of the year that enslaved Africans could uh, perform uh, dances and songs uh, in public space. All right? And so what you saw there, which kind of to a lot of people looked like a festival or you know, you know, lively music was actually a religious ceremony. And, you know, I really liked this idea of sort of like tucking in these, these very private things that, you know, could be opaque to certain audiences, asking myself like, well, who does this space really belong to? Who can see this? Who can't see this? Who would understand it? Who wouldn't? Um, you also saw um, Vinales Mayombe, Mississippi, which is a larger version of Vinales that I did at New Orleans uh, Sculpture uh, Garden. Um, and um, you saw, uh, Autumn Nothing Personal, um, uh, which was a piece that I did in um, Tercentenary uh, uh, Theater in, in, in Harvard, which is sort of like the most, you know, hallowed ground at Harvard. It's like, the, it's the most protected spot in terms of like iconic Harvard is like where all the commencements and, you know, historic speeches happen. And I kind of just like plopped this thing down in the middle of the space. Um, and took up the whole space. It was up there for a month. And there was a lot of programming, very extensive programming. I spent about two years um, 
building relationships with different people and groups at Harvard. So, you know, this is the other thing about programming is that when you do it right, you have to actually form relationships with people. You can't just sort of like fill it up, you know? Um, and so that was actually a big part of the process that may or may not be visible um, in the final uh, outcome. And um, Out of Nothing Personal was uh, a piece that was based on um, an essay by James Baldwin uh, by the same name, um, no, nothing personal. And um, it, was, it was really full of all kinds of programming um, for, for that entire month um, where many different groups of people, um, indigenous rights groups, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, like you name it, right? Lots of students groups, like this is the site of a lot of protests also at Harvard. So it was really used as almost like an outdoor room. Um, and some of them were more sort of choreographed uh, uh, co collaborations with, uh, with ART, with the American Repertory Theater, with the music department, with the dance department at Harvard and with students directly. So anybody really who wanted to do something um, could do something there. And sometimes it was just like full on spontaneous. Um, and so um, I really think of how public space can be intimate space, you know, rather than just sort of like thinking of the public as like this, you know, faceless, nameless blob, you know, I really think of the public as being just lots of different individuals, right? So lots of private publics. Um, and I'm very interested in that idea of the individual person as a kind of roving public, right? Specific little public, right? Uh, private public. Um, I'm very interested in that kind of pre-political um, uh, stuff that happens in your mind when you're experiencing something before you have to make it public, before you open your mouth to speak. Um, and that's the way I look at public space is that it's, it's my public artworks or artworks in the public realm are most successful, I think, when I can um, really create a sense of intimacy with individual viewers who happen to be experiencing it collectively, you know? Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I think we should probably stop there because we have some great questions coming in. Okay. So um, let's see here. So Joyce Hoagie saw the mural in New Orleans in person. Um, and is wondering about the size of it. And I would add to that, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you kind of adapted the Vinales imagery to this new site of New Orleans. Um, yeah, so that, that wall is a slightly curved wall um, and it's outside in the, in the new sculpture garden. Um, so it, it really kind of behaves very differently. And, and so all of those pieces are very reflective and you're not seeing it so much here. I don't know if there's another image for chance, but um, this is a very reflective surface. It's, it's a little bit more like the piece that you see behind me. Um, you know, it's like when I go like this, you can kind of see how this is a very dynamic activated surface. And, you know, so is this in front of, in, in, the, in the image that you're projecting now, where, you know, as the sunlight would change and the angle of the sun would change, this is about 60 feet long. Um, this entire surface becomes very, very dynamic, and very animated. And you also see yourself in it, which is a very important part, again, of that idea of the figure in the landscape. You know, the figure is you as a viewer rather than the, the depiction of a figure in the, in the piece. Um, and that, that sort of specter-like, ghost-like reflection of the viewer onto the surface of the work is a very important part of, of, um, of the looking. Absolutely, great. Um, so Jervana Hadid asks, um, being from Trinidad, I'm interested in two things. So part of this, I think, Teresita, you've answered, and part of it, you haven't. She asks, what sparked your interest in doing research into the Caribbean? I think we've covered that. And then how do you go about collecting this research or archival work for yourself? Mm -hmm. So I guess, what does that research process look like? Yeah, um, and well, and to answer the first part in case it was missed, uh, my, my family is from Cuba and um, I grew up in Miami, but I, I grew up not knowing a whole lot about Caribbean history. And I thought it was just kind of me, right? But it, was, it wasn't, it was just everybody. Um, it just, you know, in, in that kind of, you know, first generation American context, you know, there's like this like race to assimilate that really obliterated any understanding of our own history. Um, and so I took it upon myself in college to really learn 
um, about Caribbean history uh, and Cuban history specifically, but really all of the islands in the Caribbean, because as an archipelagic place, you know, these islands don't function as individual little places, right? They're, they're all sort of interconnected and, and relational in their uh, proximity to one another. And in, in the, the water that surrounds all of them, it's all, it's like, it's shared water. So um, that, that was part of the reason. And then um, in terms of the research, it's very, very subjective. I mean, I would, you know, if I could tell you, I would like, <laughs> I, I, can, I can't even answer that for myself. It's very, very intuitive. It's very subjective. It's very roundabout. It's not methodical. Um, it is, um, it looks, lo what it looks like is a lot of reading, a lot of um, curiosity. Um, sometimes it's you know, academic in the in the traditional sense of like sitting and reading books um, and doing that kind of research. But sometimes it'll just be like something that I, that catches my attention that I start to dig deeper in. Sometimes it's just a word that I wonder the etymology of, and it takes me down like a whole rabbit hole of research. Um, and then you know, sometimes what it looks like, quite honestly, is like making some green tea and sitting and looking at my garden, <laughs> and that's the extent of my. Um, research practice that day. Um, right. It's actually a very important part of what I do. You know, Absolutely. And I love that you mentioned titles. We didn't have time, but I would love to ask you about that at some point because you have such great titles for your work. Um, okay, so an anonymous attendee is asking about the process of making. Um, so are you making this work completely on your own? Are you working with studio assistants? How does that process work? Um, a lot of it is done in my studio. Um, it depends on the body of work. When I make big public artworks, you know, they're usually, they usually have to pass like codes and zoning laws and all kinds of things that it require engineers. Some of them are very, very complicated. Like that piece I did in Madison Square Park required many architects and engineers and all kinds of things, you know, who were building things and creating, you know, blueprints from my drawings and my models. Um, so that's one thing. Most of the sort of um, smaller things um, are all made in my studio. Uh, they're very handmade. I have, I have about four people who work with me full time. Um, I have a studio manager who's, you know, keeps everything going, and then I have about. Um, three to four people who help me with the sort of hands-on stuff. And for the most part, they're helping me with repetitive actions that I've already figured out how to make myself. Um, anything that requires uh, mark making or drawing, anything that's um, uh, really like, you can see that the mark making is all, is all me. Um, and so for the most part, um, there is a very handmade quality to most of the work um, that happens here. Um, and I say that not because I think that there's, you know, some sort of like, uh, you know, important thing about making everything oneself, but more because I learn a lot from understanding how to make something myself with my own hands. And, you know, if you, if you, if you think of like the word digital, you know, we think of technology and the digital, right? If you think of digital, digital, you know, the word digital comes from digit, it comes from your hand. Your hand is like, you know, the first technology or the most basic technology. And so I can teach people how to do something in my studio once I figure out what I want to do, because if not, I'd never finish anything. Um, but I have to figure it out myself first. And so my, my, I, I was, you know, I went to, I went to, school and uh, for sculpture and I have a real love of materiality but of also making things and understanding by touching and making something you know like a right. tactile understanding of things absolutely well that's a great segue to this next question and this unfortunately probably has to be our last one um, Molly Fiden asks how much experimentation do you go through before settling on a direction or a series Oh, uh, <laughs> gosh, that's, it depends. It depends on the series. Sometimes it's very, very uh, drawn out and long. Uh, sometimes I'll like sit with something for years and sometimes it's not, sometimes it's fast. It's, it's really hard to answer those questions. And I, um, I try not to have an answer to those questions because um, sometimes things are intuitive and spontaneous and fast uh, and sometimes they're not. For the most part, I 
don't have a lot of like, you know, I'll just be sitting there and all of a sudden have this amazing idea that just pops into my head that I have to do. Um, it, it almost never works that way. Uh, it's almost like little glimpses of something that start to um, gather force over time. Great. Well, I wish we could keep going, but we're at eight o'clock. So I think we'll have to end it there. Um, Teresita, thank you so much again for joining us tonight and really generously sharing your work and your insights with us. It's been wonderful. My pleasure. Thank you, Marina. Yeah. And I also want to thank Janice and Lindsay for their assistance with interpretation and captioning this evening and to Rebecca, who has been managing our images. Um, and then finally, just a big thank you to all of you for tuning in. Our next artist talk will take place on May 12th at noon with Diana Al-Hadid. Um, and then this coming Wednesday at 6.30, we will have a special panel discussion on NFTs in the art world. So check that out if you're interested. Um, thank you again, Teresita. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night.